Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, the Antenna Man, and I have been raising awareness about the broadcast industry's desire to encrypt free over-the-air television and significantly restrict how people can consume content from over-the-air sources. And I just learned some new information that reveals that things are even worse than we thought about this DRM encryption. And we've got some news updates as well, so let's get to it. Now, before we jump into things here, I did want to clarify a few things about the differences between the ATSC 3 standard and the ATSC 1 standard. I got a couple of emails from some viewers here in Connecticut who said, hey, I can receive WFSB and WVIT just fine. They're not encrypted for me. Why can't you get it? And the reason is, is that those viewers tuned into the ATSC 1.0 broadcast, the older technology. The stations are still required to transmit on the older technology until the FCC says they can transition. And the broadcasters are really pushing to have that transition sped up. And that's the issue here, because right now at my house, I cannot receive the ATSC 1 broadcast reliably. I can get them some days and some days not. But the ATSC 3 broadcast, because it is a superior technology, is always working for me, except for now, because those signals have been encrypted by the broadcasters. Now, let's get into an update here about our efforts to let the FCC know what is going on. And in my last video, I encouraged all of you, and I'm continuing to do so, to file complaints with the FCC via their official transition docket. And when we started this effort a couple of weeks ago, there were 1,634 comments and filings on the docket here for the regulator. And most of those were not from everyday consumers. Today, and they haven't updated it yet from the weekend, there are 3,091 comments, about 1,500, give or take, uh, that have been added over the last couple of weeks. And almost every single one of those is coming from everyday consumers who are really concerned about the industry's desire to lock things down. And you're gonna see how bad it is in a minute. Now, while getting this many people to file a comment with the FCC is great, it's still nowhere near as many who have watched these videos over the last couple of weeks. So if you haven't yet filed, go to the link that you see on screen here. You're gonna get full instructions as to how to make your comment heard. And I think it's really important that we keep the pressure on here. I am working on what I call the fall offensive, where we're going to be filing a lot more things like this, and it's going to leave, I think, a big mark here. But in the meantime, I want to make sure we get the groundwork laid here on the official docket before we take our next step. So please take a minute, go to that link, and learn all about how to file things. And if you are listening to this, the link is lon.tv slash FCC instructions. We also still have the petition going, and there we've got 7,624 signatures on our change.org petition. This is also important to sign because at some point we're going to print this out and deliver this to the FCC. So keep up the effort on these two fronts, and in about two or three weeks we're going to start the next phase of this campaign, and that will also have you filing some things somewhere, so stay tuned for that. Now, we also scored a pretty big victory here. Cord Cutters News is reporting that in late June, the FCC delayed the official transition to ATSC 3.0 until at least June of 2027. And what this means is that they can't start broadcasting solely on 3.0, and those unencrypted 1.0 broadcasts need to be transmitted until that date. And they also set another deadline of 2026 to decide whether or not they're going to push that transition out even further. So this is good news because now we've got time to continue making our case, which is really why I'm pushing this docket filing so much, because the more that the FCC can see that this is impacting people's ability to consume content the way they're supposed to over public airwaves, the more of a chance that we have to ensure that when this transition does happen, those signals will not be restricted in the way that the broadcasters want to restrict them. So let's move on to some news now, and there are some big stories this week. The first is that the HD Home Run Network tuners that support the ATSC 3 standard, namely their Flex 4K, has reached its certification state. So the firmware that is now getting installed on devices all over the country is next-gen TV certified, at least insofar as what 
Silicon Dust is reporting, along with some of the apps that connect to that device. And you would think that certification means that things can get decrypted now because that's what the broadcasters were talking about. Well, guess what? It doesn't decrypt anything because certification does not guarantee that you can decrypt DRM protected content. Nick Kelsey, who is the owner operator, if you will, of Silicon Dust reports on their forums that today's release is unrelated to playing encrypted content because that is an optional feature of the standard. But the process will be similar when they do get to that stage. Another employee of Silicon Dust, Ned S., reports on the forums that they would have gone with the DRM decryption first before certification, but the process involves, he says, a lot of red tape and waiting for other entities to do something in order to get to the next step, which kind of indicates here that they haven't really planned out what certification really means, especially insofar as encrypted content is concerned. Now, all of what's going on here contradicts what Pearl TV, the organization responsible for this mess, has been promising the public, the media, and the FCC since they started rolling out this encryption operation here. And they said in June that a next-gen certified receiver can work with the security layer. That's clearly not the case. We've got a certified device with certified firmware sending its data to a certified app and none of it seems to be able to decrypt content because now apparently there are two levels of certification and just getting the first one is no longer enough even though they were saying to people there was only one certification process here so they're either lying or they're just changing everything because they are really trying to restrict people's freedom of access here and on a related note there's a great story in tech hive from jared newman and i want you all to check out his article at lon.tv slash atsc hive and he dug into this issue and uncovered that there's a lot more to this drm and it's a lot worse than we thought so let's take a look at the first thing he uncovered that they can go into your server and delete dvr recordings once they finally certify one of these devices to record something he says it's unclear if broadcasters will do this, but they will have the capability, and you can bet your life they're going to do this. They're also going to be able to block the recording of content outright. Additionally, this is just the first one, additionally, there will be latency restrictions that effectively block out-of-the-home viewing from network tuners such as the HD Home Run Flex 4K. What this means is that every time you watch television, you're going to have to tell them where you are physically located so they can ensure that you're allowed to watch this. They're going to be able to track all of your movements just like everybody else does now. I'm not sure that's such a good thing from a privacy perspective, especially because we're talking about free over-the-air TV here. And it gets worse. So the next item here is that you will need an internet connection to stream local broadcasts around the home. So for instance, if you were connecting a Roku to an HD home run tuner, that Roku is going to need to be internet connected, even though the industry has promised that you don't need an internet connection to decrypt the content. And let me ask you this. How many of you are running coax cable and, and, and amplifiers and everything else from your antenna? No, a lot of people these days are going to want to have a single point of ingestion of the cable and then put it out onto their Wi-Fi network or onto their regular computer network. And as we've seen with ATSC 3.0, the technology is superior it has a very low bitrate signal. It works fine on Wi-Fi. And most people these days want the convenience of being able to watch TV on whatever device that they're on. But clearly here, the broadcasters don't want you doing this with their over-the-air signal. They'd rather you go to a cable provider that will collect a broadcast TV fee and then let you do it. So internet connections required not only for portable devices, but also smart TVs and other things that are not working with a coax cable. And for those of you who have run coax in your home from an antenna, you know how hard it is to get it to everywhere. We're past those days. We're in the future now. They should be allowing people the freedom to view content the way they wish. Additionally, when you make a recording, it won't work without the original tuner that captured the programming, effectively preventing users from transferring programs that they've recorded on a DVR to other devices, such as a tablet, for away from home viewing. So again, if you had something that you wanted to watch and maybe take it on a plane with you, that will be restricted unless you pay that broadcast fee to a cable provider, then you can do it. 
So you can see what they're trying to do here is make it as inconvenient as possible to tune into the over-the-air signal to push you back onto a platform that's going to collect a broadcast TV fee from you. Now, if all of that wasn't bad enough, let's talk about some stifling of innovation while we're at it because, and we've talked about this previously, it's not just the hardware tuner that has to get certified. All of the apps that connect to it also have to get independently certified, which means that apps like Channels and Plex and MB are not only going to have to get certified times two, they're also going to have to report all this data back to the broadcasters. And you can bet your life that they have to provide that data for free, which the broadcasters could probably find some way to profit from. So this is just bad on every level. And if we go back to the industry statement that uh, started all of this, they said that their big concern here was that things were going to get deep faked and redistributed without permission. And so to some degree, it's about the copy protection. And they talk about how courts have shut down illegal schemes, but it took years and cost the industry millions to shut these things down. But who really pays to protect their transmission rights and their copyrights? Well, guess what? It's not them. It's you and me, the taxpayer. Let me show you an example. So as many of you know, our friends at the cable industry have locked down all of your cable signals for many years. You need some kind of box or a cable card, in my case, to be able to make use of your cable subscription on your own equipment. And there are a number of examples of people who have taken these cable signals and retransmitted them for profit, including one case here that you can read about in Torrent Freak about Bill Omar Carasquillo, who started up his own IPTV service. He was very uh, blatant about it. He was making a fortune. Meanwhile, he was breaking the law and stealing content. Now, what's crazy about this story was that he wasn't retransmitting an over-the-air signal that was not encrypted. He was retransmitting an encrypted cable TV signal. In fact, many of them, he found some cheap splitter on AliExpress or something that would strip the copy protection off of the HDMI cable. And he was able to get these signals into a server from a number of residential cable subscribers across uh, Philadelphia and California and New York, and then started reselling the service. And so he was charged with copyright violation but he was also charged with violating the DMCA because he circumvented the encryption that was on the signal. And this shows you that this copy protection that has been on the cable services for a decade now is completely ineffective, but it's been very effective for the cable industry to collect box rental fees from every one of their subscribers. And we talked about that quite a bit in a few of my prior videos that you'll see in the video description. And at the end of the day, he was criminally charged. He wasn't civilly charged by the broadcasters. And the expense of his prosecution did not come from the broadcasters. It came from you and me, the taxpayer. And in a statement made after this guy was sentenced, the FBI said that they are the ones who are responsible for holding these people accountable. So not only do the broadcasters have the law on their side, they've got the Department of Justice and the FBI to enforce that law. So this notion that somehow this is costing them millions is bogus. It's really about collecting more millions from you and me. So take a look at what's happening here with Comcast. Just in the second quarter of 2023, they lost over half a million TV subscribers. Why did they lose TV subscribers? Because of all the fees that we're paying. On top of those stupid box rental fees, here in Connecticut, every subscriber is paying $28.10 a month, on top of everything else, to watch their local broadcast TV. So even if you don't watch it at all, you're paying for it, and they're making a lot of money with it. But now consumers are wise to this. They've got other choices, and they're cutting the cord. Many consumers are putting antennas up because that is the covenant that broadcasters made with the public many, many years ago that we're gonna grant you use of these public airways to provide a public benefit. It's not a profit center. It shouldn't be, it was never designed to be that way. We've allowed them to profit from it because we're getting a public service out of it. But now they're restricting it to such a degree not to protect copyright like they claim to be doing, but rather to protect these subscriber fees that people are sick of paying for and are now exercising their consumer power to get rid of. And so my advice to the broadcasters is, look, if you want to start a streaming service, go for it. But if you're going to make use of public airwaves, those signals need to be accessible for people, especially for those on fixed incomes, 
those who have emergency situations that they want to keep up with. There's a whole host of reasons why these public airwaves are important. And if you need an internet connection to watch your local television in your home, that's a big problem. And I think it's something that the FCC should be keeping an eye on. And hey, look, if they want to start their own streaming service, then turn those frequencies over to somebody else who can provide that public benefit. But for now, if you want to be broadcasting, we shouldn't see the types of restrictions that you're trying to put in here. And just tell us all the truth that what this is really about is protecting those broadcast fees. That's going to do it for now. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. We'll keep up on this. Remember, we're going to be doing another big push in the fall. So get ready, get those uh, typing fingers going because we're going to be sending a lot of stuff out very shortly. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and I'm the Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.